It's great to be here. It's the first time I've been here without my son being here, so I'll have to say hello to him anyway. I'm sure he's going to listen and find out what I've been saying. So, <laughs> It's great to be here on this July 4th weekend, and it's always a pleasure to come up here and watch what God is doing. May we open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your promise that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. And I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, find acceptance in your sight. In Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Are you open to God? I mean, really open to God. Have you said, Lord, I love you. I'm willing to use you. I'm willing for you to use me in any way that you want. You know, did you know that the Lord is waiting for you to do his ministry? Now, this message today is not for clergy. Every Christian is called into ministry. Everyone. We don't sometimes realize that. But if you've been born again, filled with God's Spirit, then he's waiting for you to be involved in building the kingdom of God. And one of the problems we see is that people in America have been not doing very much. You know, there's a twofold problem with many Americans in America. They're good for nothing. Now, they're good Christians, but they're doing nothing to build the kingdom of God. Or maybe just a tiny bit. But that isn't what God has called us. It says in Ephesians 2.10, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us. In other words, he already has a job for us to do. He's just waiting for us to get into the ministry. Second problem is this. Some are anxious to be involved, but they got their own message of, of what they want to do. And they're not listening to God. Let me give you three examples. Jonah from the Old Testament. He was a prophet. He saw the wicked Ninevans, and he hated them. And he felt they should be punished because they were so evil. Well, God called him to go to Nineveh to preach. What did Jonah do? He ran the other way. Why? Because he knew what type of God we serve? And if he was to preach the message and they listened, then they would be forgiven. And he didn't want them forgiven. He wanted them punished. Those dirty, rotten, no good, blah, 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 you know? But God's not that way. God loves. God calls. God's waiting for us to come and do his bidding. So, it doesn't make any difference. We need to remember that God loves all people. He doesn't care if they're Christians or non-Christians. He doesn't care if they're criminals or immoral people. He doesn't care if they're Hindus or Muslims or whatever they are. God loves the world. He wants to reach the world for Christ. And he's called us as Christians to do that job. We need to share that love of Jesus. And in the New Testament, we find a man named Saul. Saul was very devout to God. So devout that he decided to punish and even to kill these heretics that called themselves followers of the Nazarene. He did a lot of damage. But God in his mercy touched his heart, 
knocked him off the horse, so to speak. And he became the Apostle Paul. And was a great influence in the church. Not only that, but he's written so much of the New Testament. Suppose some zealot said, oh, this guy's soul's no good. <laughs> I'll kill him and save him, us from him. Can you imagine? There'd be no Apostle Paul. There'd be a lot of the books of the Bible missing if that was the case. Let me give you an example from history. 1415, the council at Constant. The church had a problem. They were not following God too well. A pope died, so they elected a new pope. My goodness. He was French. <laughs> we needed an Italian. So they elected another pope who was an Italian. But now they had two popes. Hmm. So they called this council in Constant to solve the problem. So they got together, and they finally elected the right pope. Now they had three popes for a while. It took a while. They, <laughs> they, but I don't want to get into the politics. What I want to point out is what they did that was so wrong by not listening to God. They condemned a man who was evil. Wycliffe. Do you know what that man did? He had the nerve to take the Bible and put it into English. So he had to be punished. Except he died already. So what do you do when somebody died? You dig up his bones. You burn them and throw them in the river. Today we honor this man. And today John Wycliffe has what is known as the Wycliffe Translators. And they're going around the world translating the Bible in every tongue that they can. But there was another man, John Huss. What nerve he had. He said that the church should correct itself from the Bible. What? We're the church. We're more important than the Bible. So they went and they burned him to the stake. John Huss had a disciple, Jerome of Prague. So they went and they burned him to the stake. And for 102 years, the church just kept going deeper and deeper into problems until God and touched the man's heart. In 1517, his name was Martin Luther. We know this as the Protestant Reformation. But let's be pragmatic, specific, and individual. What about you? Yeah, what about you? Do you set up certain standards and say, God, I'm <clears throat> willing to do this and that, but that's all. If you follow what I want, that's okay. Sometimes people do that. They're not open to allowing God to use them in the way that he wants to use you. You'd be surprised what God will do when you give him permission. But you've got to give him permission. Well, to better understand this, I, I want to give a little case history of a man named Philip. Now, there's two Philips in the Bible. One Philip is in the apostle. And he lived in the same town as Peter and John and Bethesda. He was the one that went around and said to his friend, Philip, he said, Philip went and called his friend Nathaniel. He said, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, about whom the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, the second Philip is found in the book of Acts. He's called Philip the evangelist to separate him from the apostle. Let me read from Acts 6, 1 to 6. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing 
the Grecian Jews among them compared against the Hebraic Jews because they complained because the widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said it would not be right to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order for us to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you. They have to be known to be full of the spirit and full of wisdom. We'll turn this responsibility over to them so that we can give our attention to prayer in the ministry of the word. The proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and also Philip, Prochorus, Nicor, Timon, Parmenius, Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. And they presented them to the apostles who prayed and laid hands upon them. Now, we like to look at the Old Testament church, the uh, New Testament church, I should say, as ideal, but they had problems too. Because whenever you have humans, you've got to find a little problems here and there. And so there was a little prejudice in the church. The problem was that the Jews who lived in the Jerusalem area, Judeans, they called them, they went and they followed the Bible perfectly as far as they thought. What do I mean by that? Well, they went to the temple. They carried all the activities that were done, and they did that. But the Hellenistic Jews, they didn't come from that area. So they didn't follow all these things. And so they thought, hey, we're holier than they are. And so we're a little prejudiced. They're not as good as us. So they had trouble with the food distribution. And so these seven men, Hellenistic men, were chosen. And they were to handle waiting on the tables. Now notice this to wait on tables. Three qualifications that needed. First of all, they had to be born again. John 3.3, 3, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, unless a one, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How do you do that? Simple. You repent. You make a U-turn into your life. You need to turn your life over to Jesus. And then be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Second qualification. Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Pastor Eric has been preaching about the Holy Spirit, so you know pretty much about that. In Acts 8, 17, it says, Peter and John placed hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Acts 10, 44, as Peter was preaching, the Holy Spirit fell upon those that were listening. So we see two examples laying hands on somebody, praying for them to receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Or a person just being open enough to pray. And as they pray, the Holy Spirit falls on them. I remember one time a group of women that were studying the Bible with my wife, Marion. And they were studying about the Holy Spirit. And they said, well, how do we receive it? I said, just go home. Ask for it. If you're sincere, it will come. My superintendent of Sunday school prayed that whole summer. She was very upset. Nothing happened. So I said, oh, come up to my house. My wife's there. We'll pray with you. She came up, laid hands on her, and three seconds later, she was praying in tongues, receiving the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So sometimes people need a little touch. Other times they're just open, and it falls upon them. Now, the third qualification is they had to be full of wisdom. They, they knew who these people were. And you've got to have good common sense to even wait on tables. Proverbs 2.6, for the Lord gives wisdom. 
From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. From these seven, Philip was one of them. Philip was a born-again believer. He had been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. He had an anxiousness to, to really serve the Lord. Have you ever felt that way? You love the Lord. You're filled with his spirit and you're anxious to do something. And so God says to Philip, wait on tables. Huh? Wait on tables. Uh, we say, Lord, you, you don't quite understand. I, I'm f I, I know you. I love you. I'm filled with the power of God. I'm ready to do anything for you. Wait on tables. But, but Lord, <laughs> you don't know how useful I can be. Wait on tables. We need to be willing to do small things sometimes first before God uses us. Psalm 84, 10. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. Matthew 25, 23 says something nice. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things, I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your happiness. Come and share your master's happiness. Jesus is teaching a principle here that in no matter what capacity that you serve the Lord, whether you are an usher, a greeter, you're singing on a worship team, you're a Sunday school teacher, you're helping in the office, or you're scrubbing toilets. If you're doing it in the name of Jesus, God considers that the very best there is. And also remember, when we have been faithful and do small things, James 4.10 says, humble yourself in the Lord, and he will lift you up. Amen? Hope you can hear me. My voice is a little different this morning here. Acts 8.1. And Saul was there giving approval to Stephen's death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. All except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Verses 4 and 5. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city to Samaria and proclaimed Christ there. Wow. Stephen, a waiter, had been killed. But Philip was still on fire for Jesus. It says in the scriptures, blessed are Ye, when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake, rejoice, be exceedingly glad. And he goes on to say on there this wonderful thing, great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Two things we see about Philip. He was ready to put his life on the line for Jesus. He was truly a disciple. But look where Philip was. He was in Samaria. Now, we don't understand this too much today, but Samaritans and Jews, there was a hatred towards each of them. And yet, Philip was so open that he was willing to go to Samaria and preach the word. Now take a look at that. We need to be open to the Lord. No matter where he sends us. No matter who he tells us to speak to. Look at Acts 8, 6 to 8. He goes and begins to preach. And when the crowds heard Philip. And saw the miraculous signs he did. 
they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many. Many paralytics and cripples were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Verses 12 and 13. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. That's what we see in the Bible. Acts 2.43, Acts 5.12 states that signs and wonders were done through the apostles. Acts 4.40 says that the church prayed that God would stretch out his hand to heal and that signs and wonders would follow in the name of Jesus. In Acts 8, we just read about Philip and what happened there and all the miracles in his ministry. And Acts 14.3 says that God granted signs and wonders through Barnabas and Paul. But Hebrews 2.4 says this, the people paid close attention to the gospel because God bore witness to it by signs and wonders and various miracles. Philip was open to God. He was not concerned about what he could do. He knew that if he turned himself over to God, God could do great things through him. So don't try to put the brakes on God because you say, I'm not qualified. I, I can't do that. You see, with God, nothing's impossible. And if you're open to God, you can begin to see the miraculous working in your life. When you're open to God, God has the ability to do what he wants to do. But we need to be open. Open to him. Philip was open. Today we stop wondering what you can do. Start to realize what God can do through you. Now, Philip was also a man under authority. And if we look at Acts 8, verse 14 through 17, we find this. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. And when they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. What a fantastic ministry that Philip had. Just imagine, from a waiter to a city, a citywide evangelist with miracles and wonderful things taking place because he was open to God. Why did Peter and John come to Samaria? Because Philip was willing to be under authority. He realized that Samaritans and Jews didn't mix. And so he was doing something brand new. Therefore, he wanted their approval of what he was doing. And they came in and saw what they were doing, laid hands on them, and they received the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Now, it doesn't take the apostle. It doesn't take some evangelist. Anybody who's open to the Lord, who's a Christian, can lay hands on somebody and pray for them that they would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We don't need to be somebody special to do that. Philip could have then very easily laid hands on them and they would have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. No problem with that at all. But he was in the Lone Ranger. He was under authority. He wanted approval for them. And they gave their blessing for what he was doing. As Christians, let me just remind you of two things. God does set up authority. In the church, for instance, the authority is the pastor. Now, he has advisors that advise him, but the, the authority, the way God has said it, is for a pastor to be in charge of a particular church. But let me warn you, never put yourself in a church 
where the pastor isn't under authority himself. For instance, Pastor Eric is under the authority of the uh, New England. And so he has to answer to the superintendent of the New England district. Also, we were required every year to sign a paper saying that we uphold the word of God and teach it. And if I don't sign that every year, I lose my right to be in this organization and to be a pastor. So we need to put ourselves under authority. All of us need to be under some authority. That's why I don't believe in being in a church that has no authority over them because they can go way off. And we're seeing that today. Many churches today where the pastors no longer believe the Bible. As far as I was concerned, they should be kicked out. They should find another job. If you can't preach the word of God and you don't believe the word of God, get out. Don't be a false prophet. Also note how Philip's heart was so open to see God's heart. Philip advanced from waiting on tables to be a big-time evangelist, so to speak, but he was open to hear God's voice to go see one individual. We're going to look at Acts 8, 26 to 27. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out on his way, and he met an Ethiopian. He was a eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. The man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Through this encounter, as we read the scriptures, we find that he led him to Christ and then baptized him. But look how open Philip was. First, we see Philip being led by the voice of the church. Then he's being led due to circumstances that led to persecution, that he found himself in Samaria, and he preached the word there. He was then led by an angel. And then in verse 29, it says, the inner voice of the Holy Spirit led him to speak to this Ethiopian. Who is this Ethiopian? who traveled 200 miles to worship in Jerusalem. Well, you find him in his chariot, and he's struggling trying to understand the word of God. And Philip comes and explains it to him. Today, let me tell you, we are living in a very spiritual country today. Now, you might be surprised, and I say spiritual, because you say, well, a lot of people don't believe in Jesus here. But they're spiritual. They're searching. They're like this Ethiopian. They're, they're looking to find out the true God. They're trying to find out what, what the whole thing is about. And they need a Philip. And you need to be that Philip to explain. Let me tell you something. If you learn a little bit of apologetics, we have more proof for the Bible being the word of God, the most trusted scripture in the history of the world. We have more scientific proof for God than we've ever had. We have archaeology and all these other things. And so you, you know these things. You're able to help somebody understand and begin to believe the Bible because it's true. And we have testimony after testimony, evidence after evidence that proves that God's word is true. Please bear with me just a little longer. I want to show you how Philip was so open to God that he broke down three more barriers. The first was this Ethiopian was a Gentile. So he went to a Gentile. The apostle Peter had to have a vision. Then he had to have an angel speak to him before he was willing to go to the Roman centurion years later. But Philip was open because God was leading him. Philip was open to do whatever the Spirit told him to do. Second, there's no barrier among race. Philip was bringing a message to a black race, even to a Gentile, before the white Gentiles had even received the word. 
Now, this official came not from Ethiopia, but if you read the, the Greek, uh, the Hebrew, you begin to, uh, and the Greek, you find out that this was from Nubia, which was south of Egypt. And the king, Tarharka, was one of the most noted rulers of Nubia. It was during his reign, the 25th dynasty, when the black Nubia king overthrew Egypt and ruled over Egypt from 720 to 660 B.C. By the way, he's the only Nubian uh, named in the Bible in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 9. Black Americans today are very proud of their heritage. What a wonderful heritage they had there in ancient Nubia. And during the Roman period, we find Philip being open to God, recognizing that everyone, everyone, God loved. And that we need to bring the Bible, those scriptures, the word of God to them. Paul wrote this. And God made of one blood all nations of men. Philip knew this already. There's neither a Greek nor Jew, slave or free, male or female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. And that's what we have to realize. We're all one in God, in Christ, and that God loves everybody. And it's our job to share the word of God with everyone. And the third thing, this Ethiopian was a eunuch. And as a eunuch, he was not allowed, according to Deuteronomy 23.1, to have too close association with the Jewish people. So when he went to Jerusalem, he had to stay by the gate. He couldn't mix with the Jews because they didn't consider him whole. But Philip didn't bother, didn't bother him at all. It doesn't matter if you're whole or unwhole, whether you're saint or sinner. There's absolutely no barrier when it comes to God. He opens the door to anyone who wants to come and to love him. Do you see the uh, spiritual significance in Philip being able to reach this man? Philip was open to the God in the now. The rest of the church took a little bit longer to learn some of these things. But Philip knew him right away. John 3.16, God loves the world. In the Old Testament, in Ezekiel 33.11, we find the heart of God. Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? 1 Timothy 2.4. God wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting that anyone should perish, but that everyone would come to repentance. What a tribute to Philip. What closeness he had with God that he was able to be open to God and to follow him. First, we see the encounter with Samaritans, then with a Gentile, and even with a eunuch. The last glimpse of Philip was 20 years later. Acts 21, 8 and 9. Luke writes this as for Paul. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at a house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. That must have been an interesting meeting. Philip was waiting on tables with Stephen. Stephen was killed. Now Philip is meeting with Saul or the apostle Paul who killed Stephen. But the point I want to really make out is this. 20 years have passed. And Philip, it says, was still with Jesus. And he had four daughters who were, his family was with the Lord. 
it's not so much how you start, but how you finish. What is your relationship with God? Stay strong with the Lord Jesus Christ. Could we stand? I just want to point out a few things that we can learn from Philip. First of all, Philip was a man who knew the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't know if there's anybody here today that has not yet made that decision to follow Jesus. Let me tell you, there's no greater joy than to be adopted into the family of God. No greater joy to know Jesus in a personal way. And my, my prayer today is if there's anyone here that they might just receive him. I'm going to ask everybody to pray this prayer with me, all right? Lord Jesus, I love you. Thank you for dying for me. Forgive me for my sins. Help me to make you Lord in my life. And thank you as you come into my heart. I accept you, Lord Jesus. And thank you for that gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. That's how simple it is to receive him. And how wonderful it is when the Holy Spirit guides us. Are you walking in the power of the Holy Spirit? That's something that all Christians need to do. Not in your power, but in his power. Are you willing to serve God in any capacity that he calls you? Philip was. Are you able to be under authority? No lone rangers. We're part of the body of Christ. Are you so concerned for seeking the lost that nothing will stop you from witnessing for Jesus? And are you saying yes, yes to Jesus right now? You may be seated as we prepare our hearts to receive communion this morning. Let me just read a couple of verses from John 6. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me even though you have seen me. However, those the Father has given me will come to me and I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. And this is the will of the Father, that I should not lose even one of those he has given me, but that I should raise them up on the last day. For it is my Father's will that all who see the Son and believe in him should have eternal life. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11 some instructions of the, taking the Lord's Supper. For I pass on to you what I receive of the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. This rep represents the body of Jesus Christ, a body that was broken, a body that was pierced, a body that was crucified to take our punishment so we would be set free and be acquitted before the throne of God. All of you take of this bread.
This represents the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood that cleanses us from all of our sin, the blood that brings healing. And there have been times in my ministry when people have taken this blood of Christ and were actually healed of an illness. Because the blood of Jesus brings us salvation and healing. All of you drank of it. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for dying on the cross and suffering in our place that we will be justified before your throne and pass into eternal life of that promise with you. Help us to be so open to your spirit that we will do whatever you call us to do, that we might bring glory to you and advance the kingdom of God through the ministry that you have given us. Help us then to do your will joyfully. In Jesus' name, amen. with expectation. Come knowing that God loves you and wants to do something in your life. God bless you all. <laughs>